So yeah, today we are going to talk about the astrologian class and its relationship to astronomy, astrology, and medicine in the history of science and medicine. So I have brought us here to the first dicasterial observatorium of ethereal and astrological phenomena. That's quite a mouthful. Um, in the lore of Final Fantasy XIV, there are two particular societies that are really big into astronomy and astronomy. Those are the Ishgardians, who we've kind of talked about a little bit before, who kind of like the, the Final Fantasy XIV take on this medieval European kind of theme. And the Charleans, who live on an island nation, are somewhat more isolationist, but also a little bit less religiously intense than the Ishgardians. And it's kind of interesting because in the lore of Final Fantasy XIV, there are also two different schools of the astrologian, represented by these two different nations. The Ishgardian is more focused on divinatory practices, in fact, that they mostly try to look to the stars to determine troop movements in their ongoing war against the dragons, um, whereas the Charlayan astrologians are actually more focused on it as a medicinal actual art about the relationship of the kind of like individual's body with the larger cosmos. And it's really interesting. I don't know if the designers of the game really like did the research into this, but it actually does show an interesting split that goes into the history of astronomy, astrology, and medicine all the way back to antiquity between its relationship to medicine and its role as a purely more abstract divinatory art. Um, in the lore of the game, um, astrologians kind of attune their ether to the movement of the heavens, uh, which is a really interesting kind of motif, which we'll be talking about actually throughout the evening. So that's the main class I play here. I'm actually an astrologian right now. And one of the things, the main weapon for an astrologian is this kind of like sphere thing, right? I have one version here, you can see it. Now, I'm not going to talk about tarot because tarot is also a thing that astrologians um, kind of uh, deal with in the game. We can talk about that in another stream if folks are interested. But more interested in this spinning orb, and there's a whole bunch of different versions of that orb. Star globes, they're called. But in real life, it seems to be kind of loosely based off of a thing called an armillary sphere, which armillary just means consisting of hoops or rings which is a three-dimensional model of a solar system. And these models of the solar system used for kind of, you know, like astronomical observation or demonstration purposes, you really start seeing in China, India, and all around the Mediterranean in antiquity as this kind of interesting kind of scientific tool and device. So I think it's kind of cool that something similar gets used as the astrologian's kind of main arms um, in Final Fantasy XIV. So yeah, I'm going to take us then, before I go into the next section, to the main training center for astrologians in the game, which is once again in the Ishgardian capital. Phew, this is convenient as I teleport around. Which can be found here, once again, in Ishgard, in its perpetually snowy city. Now again, one of the interesting things in terms of the lore of the game is that the Charlayan practice is relatively um, secret. And in fact, part of the whole story of when you do the astrologian job quest is that you're working with people who wish to introduce kind of the medicinal practices of the astrologian to Ishgard, which is considered to be somewhat heretical by the Ishgardian church. So this is the space, it's kind of nice. You see, again, these examples of these glo globes, star globes, you can actually see the various little points of constellations on them there. Read some measures, just poking around. Ba -doop -ba -doop. This is, looks like a, some sort of reflecting telescope. I mean, I don't know, a few of reflecting telescopes there and there, but yeah. At least those ones are next to windows. It's true. It's true though you'd want to like open the window if you're just looking through that glass, a telescope would really like pick up on that as a as a as an issue. Another foggy day. Yeah, always. Mm hmm Yeah, and so the history of telescope technology itself is kind of interesting, right? Because I mean, a lot of people will falsely tell you that Galileo invented the telescope. Um, this is in fact not true. He did modify it considerably. 
um, which actually enabled him to make his observations of the moons of Jupiter, which in classic kind of courtier fashion, he probably went about naming after the sons of his patron, the Medicis. Um, but he did not, in fact, invent the telescope. It was, uh, I think, some sources say that it was an earlier Dutch invention, but he did improve upon it. Um, and you see this throughout kind of the history of science. Newton, uh, Isaac Newton did some contributions to the history of the telescope to kind of, and as we see this development of reflecting telescopes, which help kind of reduce sources of errors and in clarity, and particularly an issue called chromatic aberration, um, which has to do with about how like light splits into rainbows when you're kind of trying to like, like reflect, or when it's trying to like catch faraway objects. But yeah, so that's a bit of like uh, more like telescope history, but most I'm going to be talking about actually astrology as a practice um, in like and, and its relationship to medicine in antiquity. So I'm going to be doing a little bit of extra talking here rather than gaming. <laughs> an astrolabe as well. Yes, you're quite right, Ultra Hex. Though if my understanding is that an astrolabe is more of a like a flat instrument with rotation with rotational things on the on, on its face. Uh, I could be wrong though. But yeah, also I, I have a lot of notes and a lot of interesting things to talk about, so I'm going to be actually dividing my attention between gaming and, uh, and chatting. Uh, at the very least, I'll take us to a place that's perhaps, oh, it's a little thematically star-themed place. Star-themed, star-themed. I mean, let's go back to the moon. It's a great place. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ultra Hex. It's wonderful we can Google things, or... Well, I mean, I'd like to be able to do things other than Google them to find out, but, I mean, monopolies. So, yes, once again, we are in the moon, on the moon, and you can actually see... One of the interesting things about the, again, the, just like the, the graphic design of Final Fantasy XIV is you see those particular, like, red stars and the green stars? Uh, let's see some other ones. There actually are, like, f fictional constellations in the game world that actually do kind of move around the sky, uh, which is kind of cool that they kind of put that thought into it. But yeah, to, to understand the history uh, that I'm talking about, particularly in astronomy, astrology, and medicine, it's important to keep three things in mind. Firstly, for thousands of years, astronomical observations were closely tied in with measures and understanding of the nature of time itself, with some cultures even believing that it was the movement of the stars that it was itself time. Right? And you think about this, before the kind of invention of modern clocks and chronometers, really, you look to nature for stable, steady patterns. So a great deal of ways of kind of determining time, months, calendar years, all of that, depended upon astronomical observations. It was a very important part of navigational practices and all sorts of things, right? If you look at um, ancient Egyptian, for instance, astro astronomy and its connection to like timekeeping, right? The Egyptian priests could tell within like, I think days when the Nile would flood based on the rising of Sothis or the dog star along the ecliptic or the ecliptic is just the line in which it crosses, you know, for the horizon. So this is a really important aspect of just knowing what time it was and, and it's considered to be potentially connected to, again, the nature of time itself. Secondly, while people have understood the difference between the movement of the stars and planets and predictions based on those movements, until roughly around the time of Copernicus in the 1500s, the Latin term astronomia and astrologia, which we have divided off into these two different concepts, were often used interchangeably. Right? You see this a lot in kind of the history of science and, and occult stuff, that like a lot of terms which we now think of as being very d divided historically were, had much more fluid boundaries. And finally, I think it's also important and interesting to note that the divinatory aspect, you know, predicting the future qualities of astronomy based on the stars has been controversial since antiquity. It's not that everyone has always believed in astrology as, you know, a, a real valid practice. Even in antiquity, people were going like, it doesn't work that way, y'all, while other people were very, very invested in it. And in particularly medical doctors, which is interesting, right? But let's go even a little bit further back um, to ancient Mesopotamia. Um, like Mesopotamia roughly corresponds with modern day Iraq and the surrounding region, but historically there were a whole bunch of different civilizations that kind of like rose and fell in that area in late or in, in antiquity. We have the Sumerians, the Assyrians, the Akkadians, and the Babylonians. And in antiquity, they were known for being exceptional astronomers, that they kept incredibly accurate 
observations of solar and celestial phenomenon that actually so much so over hundreds of years that they could actually refer back to their own records going back like 500 years or more to kind of predict the patterns of the planets which is really cool and these are actually very you know bureaucratic societies um i don't know if you know that meme going around about ian nasir and his infamously poor quality copper Aaron, is, you, you you exist on the internet is that is that a, th a thing you've seen is that the meme of the guy who like the oldest known person and we only know because he got like bad customer reviews he did get yeah he got bad i don't know if he's the uh, no, oldest known person but like yeah we definitely have like yeah it, it is one of the kind of like someone was sent a complaint basically about him and it is poor quality copper um which i've been seeing doing the rounds of tumblr again because i'm tumblr trash but uh yeah and also like this this time period and this group is really interesting because it's because of the sumerians actually and their sexagesimal sexagesimal base system you know base 60 system that we have a lot of our current units of time right like i mean if we're in the metric system our time system isn't metric why are there 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour that goes all the way back to the primacy of mesopotamian astronomical observations and its connection to timekeeping actually Right, and then and, and the Sumerians influence on the Babylonians and so on and so forth. So, okay, time. It's it's easier to see how you know astronomy and timekeeping are connected, right? I mean, we still kind of do that nowadays, but where does medicine come into all of this? Right, Who, just checking the chat. Um, so if you're just making kind of general everyday observations, you know, about the sun and the moon, they do seem to have an effect on the earth, right? I mean, you can tell that this, this is kind of this like, you know, intuitive, just naked eye observation. Sun evaporates stuff. Sun gives you a sunburn. Sun is, you know, a celestial body, but it clearly has influences on the earth. And the same is the true, you know, of, uh, like, of, through ob naked eye observation of the moon, right? The, 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 the tides and menstrual cycles and other, all sorts of different natural cycles seem to be connected with the movement of s celestial bodies. Now, this could be an interesting time to talk about the relationship between, you know, causality and um, correlation. But at that point, they were trying to think, understand it in terms of a ca some potential causal relationship, not just a correlated relationship. And based on that, it's not that much of a leap in logic to go like, okay, if these big so, so, uh, stellar bodies, you know, influence what happens on Earth, what about the other planets? What about the stars? Do they have some kind of subtler but still kind of very present influence on the natural world and on the people who, like us who live in it? So actually, during the old Babylonian period, and this is around 2000 to 16,000 BCE, healers and priests would actually have medications spend the night under the stars to like literally in the stars to be infused by astral effect effectiveness to make them more potent uh healing substances which is really kind of interesting oh oh hey cool first time chatter hello formidios hey there i caught your segment on youtube for the neurodiversity series to each their orb i work in public library and thought it was great so this is the first stream i've been able to attend well welcome lovely to seeing you thank you for coming out um and thank you for your patience during our our technical issues there at the start so yeah hopefully this is interesting to you um for midios yeah so Star, so healers would send stars, let's medicines kind of get absorbed by the, uh, get absorbed, absorb stellar influences. But this was also because in um, old Babylonian period, there was also a belief that the stars could likewise could not just in infuse medicines, but cause sickness themselves, right? Um, this, this, you see some kind of uh, Babylonian medical treaties talking about how the sickness have come down from the stars of the sky. Um, and so there was this kind of like, stellar phenomenon were intimately interconnected with both health and sickness on the earth and because of this diseases were actually assigned to specific planets representing gods as well as to the constellations and the zodiac and the zodiac is actually also a really old concept right the zodiac goes back to the persian period in mesopotamia this associated between illness and days of the month um, and also were modified to apply to zodiac signs ba -do, ba -do, ba -do. Ba -do, ba -do. Oh, good stuff. Glad for videos. All right. So here, I have a lot of stuff I could talk about, but what do folks want me to do? I mean, I could keep on just just nattering at you over top of like a starscape here. 
Um, or we could actually get ourselves into a stellar themed dungeon or trial. <laughs> Chromatic Aberration does sound like a D&D monster. It's up there with the Rust monster. Mm -hmm. Chromatic creatures, there's aberration creatures. Mm -hmm. It's a fusion. Double plus aberration. Mm -hmm. Any preference in the chat? All right. All right, well, I'm going to just keep on going for a little bit then. So I don't know if you know Hippocrates, the Greek healer, you know, of the Hippocratic Oath fame, you know, to do no harm, and Galen, who was actually a later um, Roman healer, both based the medical theories on the relationship between heavenly bodies and human bodies, right? Like parts of the body also as well as diseases were like to the zodiac planets, and that's a carryover from you know, the ancient Persians. Also, though, this continued on well into the Renaissance, right, where astronomy and astrology were studied by students of medicine in some of the earliest universities, which is kind of cool. And even going back to, like, the kind of history of more of, like, basic astronomy, you've heard of the Ptolemaic system? Hippocrates hypocrite joke. <laughs> yeah, that's a thing. Mm-hmm. You do you, boss, as wildly average. Okay, I shall. So I'm just going to talk a little bit more about this stuff then, just for the sake of having a chat. Um, so you might have heard of the Ptolemaic system, right? This was the older model of the solar system in which, you know, the Earth was the center of the world, or center of the universe. Um, you know, and the sun went around the Earth and all of that, which was based on like a lot of you know, Earth-based astronomy. Now, Claudius Ptolemy, this is about the second century after the Common Era himself actually highlighted the similarities between the practices of astrology and medicine in his Tetra Biblios, which is considered to be his kind of major work um, on cosmology. And interestingly enough, pointed out that both use the same word, prognosis. You know, we've heard of medical prognosis, you know, like what's the prognosis, doctor? You know, um, to, to mean, you know, like what's, what's going to happen? What, what is your kind of divinatory outcome, right? He, called, he described both as being stochi stochiastic, which is to say conjectural arts which use predictions but are not always successful but the goal is to do what is humanly possible to succeed right just as medicine is in many ways an inexact science ptolemy was like so is astrology and they have a very similar kind of a points to determine you know how long is this person going to live <laughs> which has a very direct correlation on you know life expectancy as we understand it and this was throughout the kind of the, the mediterranean in the middle east um throughout the late antiquity throughout the, the medieval period. Another famous kind of uh, commentator, Abu Mashar, um, also talked about this relationship between medicine and astrology in relationship to life expectancy. But I want to just kind of skip over that a little bit and talk about the Renaissance period. Um, now, the Renaissance period, like, there is so much interesting connections between the history of the occult and science in the Renaissance period, right? Like, a whole bunch of things that we think of as being, you know, science were described by Renaissance thinkers as natural magic. I mean, it was observing patterns in the world and observing patterns in nature and how they connect things and how an understanding of those patterns can allow you to intervene in them in some meaningful way. And one figure in this is a fellow named Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, whose dates were roughly, were roughly alive during the 1400s. His oration on the dignity of man has been described as the manifesto of the Renaissance. And it's interesting because it's, it's a delightfully heretical document. I'd recommend checking it out sometime because he does talk about like magic and the role of the mage in society um, and talking about the dignity of the human soul and spirit in relationship to magic and in relationship to actually like modifying the world around us, which is kind of cool. Um, interestingly enough, though, right, uh, Pico della Mirandola was actually critical of what he called judicial astrology or this astrology that to just divine the future kind of in its entirety. Um, but he did accept what he described as the physical dimensions of it, which he called natural astrology and again was more associated with medicine. And this is a view he shared with a whole bunch of Renaissance kind of occultists and natural philosophical thinkers, including Marsilio Ficino, which is another figure you might want to look up, who is also roughly contemporaneous with him. You're talking about, you know, the Magus, having correctly mastered these teachings, can ma manipulate material objects in order to draw down the benefit of higher cosmic and immaterial forces in his writing, through which he is united with the world soul, or the anima mundi, right? Um, he, he described this all-pervading world spirit, 
um, which unites the soul of the world to the individual's body. And again, I've talked a bit before about like the microcosm and the microcosm, which is actually an ability of the astrologian. Um, that's part of this kind of Renaissance occult medicinal kind of connection. Um, and a lot of these people got in trouble with the Catholic Church for this. I, I, I should stress, it was a very widespread and interesting belief. A lot of learned people were quite invested in this, but it was still also controversial at the time period. Alrighty. So I have a little bit more I could talk about in terms of astrology, astronomy, and medicine from the 1700s onward. But just so that I don't bore you all to tears, I'd say let's try to do this while doing a dungeon of some kind, shall we? Let's, let's go hard mode. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So we have a few options here that in space. The, the Iatoscope is, is a later game dungeon, which technically is actually about like the, the going to kind of like the afterlife, but it's very star themed. Um, the Dead Ends is technically in space um, and going through all of these different civilizations. Uh, let's see. Hmm, sorry? Star Afterlife Zone. Starry Afterlife? All righty, let's, any other votes for which dungeon we should go to? We have one for Starry Afterlife. Um, let's see, any others might be relevant. Or we have the twinning, which is more like the f predicting the future, but it's less aesthetically on point. The hardest one for Medio says, <laughs> all right, thank you for that. Well, I try to. Sounds, sounds delightful. Well, the hardest one would be the dead ends. So, all right. Erin, I think you're great, but you're also my co-presenter uh, today. I think we will go for the audience suggestion here and go into the hardest one, which is... All righty, let's go into the hardest one. Let's see if I can try to talk without wiping my party. <laughs> you're welcome, Formidios. Mm-hmm. So this is kind of like the end of days and going to different planets. So it's kind of dramatic. I will give my polite wave to the other group. So, oh, can I do that? All right, Laxi, I'm, uh, let's see if I can do this. <laughs> So in terms of the lore of what's going on right here, there's going to be spoilers for Endwalkers. So basically there was this being that was like sent out to explore the cosmos and gave in to despair because every planet she found was a dead planet. Um, uh -oh. uh, and it kind of corrupted her um, with hopelessness. Just looking at kind of, you know, like we talk about like the second law of thermodynamics, right? And how it predicts kind of an ultimate heat death of the universe and you know that all things pass away and so part of the major theme of oh god i need to keep them alive um part of the major theme of the endwalker series is this kind of like what is the role of hope in a you know a vast and indifferent cosmos um and so that's one of the reasons why the game this this uh expansion of the game has you going in repeatedly going into various outer space like settings and this and in this particular dungeon we're actually visiting kind of the, the last days and a whole bunch of different planets different civilizations that have risen and fallen and again uh, if people are saying anything in the comments i will have a hard time seeing you right now just because of my setup Whew, quickly check in big upside down vibes that's true. Phew. Oh, sorry. What was that, Aaron? Oh, everything in this game is just very aesthetic. Oh yeah, no, it's like that's that's the thing I really appreciate about Final Fantasy fourteen. They they put a lot of thought into the music and artistic design. Oh yeah, I've been forgetting to put down my tarot cards on people. I'm a, all of the things I need to remember to do. Good thing these tankers are a warrior. They tend to be more self-sufficient than other hit tanks. <laughs> uh, 
Oop, let's get you back up, friendo. See that little bluebird there is actually is actually that being I mentioned. Um, it's kind of this like bluebird of hope and the blackbird of despair. Are a recurring motif in the um, Endwalker expansion. And I think Meteon is a specific reference as well to something biblical. Um, but I could be mistaken. They do like their references. Again, just because I main Astrologian doesn't mean I'm good. <laughs> I should also stress. Mm -hmm. Being good at games is really overrated. Mm -hmm. Oh, this guy. Boy. He's, got, he's got a little bit of a growth going on. I forget all of the mechanics too, so let's see how this goes. I don't like the look of that. I'm going to give everyone a group heal. Yeah. Uh oh. Oop. Oh no, I. Oh, I misjudged that. Got to keep myself going. Got to keep myself going. If the healer goes down, it's a bad time for everyone. Oh no, oh no, that uh, that disease was a uh, fail. Okay, Red Mage, Red Mage can res me. Res Mage, go. Thank you, you're getting my commendation afterwards. Hey. Oh no. ba do boo boo ba do boo boo ba do ba do South wind begins to blow. Okay, so it's... But what does this mean? I'm just going to hang out where the other players are. So at least if I uh, get wrecked... Yeah, yeah. If, if At least if I get wrecked, I'll not be wrecked alone. It's, it's less embarrassing that way. <laughs> God damn it. God damn it. What do I need to do? Damage taken increased. I want to get the red mage up because he can res me if I go down. What? How do I get out of that? How do I get out of the? Oh no! Uh -oh. You, you know what? Know what I was saying earlier, Aaron? That I haven't actually wiped a party yet on stream. You <laughs> jinxed yourself. I I think I jinxed myself here. Oh no! <laughs> Cause yeah, he's, he's he, we got wrecked. We got wrecked, everyone. Oh, All right, not sure I get that. What are the consequences of that in final? I don't know much about. This. I mean. Time and patience. Um, and one of the things I really appreciate about it is, unlike older massively multiplayer online RPGs, there's not a lot of consequences to uh, to death. It doesn't damage your items. You don't lose things really. Um, Got to find the empty spot before the wind starts blowing. That's a big reason I've never gotten into Dark Souls or mm. the new one, mm -hmm. Elden Ring. Yeah, yeah. I have no patience for going back to retrieve my souls. That that's I've fair. I've never even tried. I just know I would be bad. At it. <laughs> I find the art kind of interesting, but yeah, it's right. I I struggle stress with that. It was really bad in some of the early MMORPGs. I remember like Vita penalties, which would like stack and would keep on giving you like percent debuffs to all of your stats and like you could only get rid of them by either like killing enemies or just waiting but if you got too many it was almost impossible to kill anything so I just like would have my character lie down on a hill while I read a book <laughs> to, to, just to just to just just to heal up just he, he, which I guess is kind of immersive in a way <laughs> alrighty let's try this again So the wind is blowing a southward wind. So where's everyone going? Because I, I get that the wind's blowing, but like, what is it supposed to be doing? That blank spot over there. Okay. 
Okay, it's, so it's going to blow that area of effect all the way down. Gotcha. Games like, you're bad at this, go touch grass. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I feel that with some games. Mm -hmm. like, absolutely not. I've done with you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe some fake grass. Craven Companion. What does that mean? I don't like the sound of that. It's good to know mechanics. A southward wind. Okay, south again. Alrighty. A plague descent. Oh, oh, oh. The escapism. I mean, also true. Alright, then get over here. Okay. There we go. Think we got it this time. But allergies, yeah, <laughs> exactly. The real debuff is allergies. Which is also seasonal, right? Which I think is kind of interesting. We can actually we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, if you, when I can actually pay a bit more attention. Because seasonal, like the seasonal relation, like the dynamics of like health and wellness was also one of the reasons why, you know, paying attention to um, the stars and paying attention to like, t well, the, how time of, see, yeah, how time of the year affects medical outcomes um, was also part of that discussion. Cough up. Uh oh. Uh oh. Is that chasing me? That is chasing me. Rude. Oh, Craven Companionship. I feel like people want to stack during... Oh, oh god. Oh god. I did... That's new. That's new. Haha! -ha! Thank you, allies. Well. Phew! Alright, that's the, the first of three bosses. Next world. Vision of another world unfolds before your eyes. Judgment Day. Okay, this little word that pops up is so ominous. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now we're in a technological world. Oof, but allergies indeed. Those almost look like armadillos. It's kind of cool. Armadillos made out of like solar panels. Oh my god, I was. Yep, yep, yep. That's uh, that's on me. That is all on me. People don't watch streamers to like watch games be played well, right? Like that's that that's just not the culture. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. But please let me know in the chat if I am mistaken. <laughs> as long as there's facts or humor. You have, mm -hmm. to have facts, humor, or skill. Indeed. Sweet. Like we have facts and humor. Mm -hmm. I don't know enough about this game to know how well you're doing. I'm oh no, I all the words. So all, all the words. Mm -hmm. I keep saying aspected helios, which I keep reading as aspected hellos, which is Aspe really as benefic aspected oh god. Yeah, helios is referring to the I think it's helios is referring to the sun. Collective unconscious. Gravity. Neutral sect, horoscope, like there's a lot of these abilities. Oh my. For Midios, I hope you're happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Only pro stream. Get good. I appreciate the slash sarcasm. <laughs> I was at a library conference there, and they were talking about uh, the reasons why to like use GitHub and improve your skills with GitHub. And I wanted to make a get good joke. Um, but I let the moment pass, so now you have to endure it. <laughs> I'm glad you're enjoying it from videos. Oh god, because my tank isn't. My tank really isn't. Phew, all right. Yep. Zero time to look at my notes about, like, history facts. <laughs> Your party needs you. Mm -hmm. A robot ironically called the Peacekeeper in the ashes of a broken world. Press X to doubt. Uh-huh. <laughs> Oh god. Oh god. I uh, don't like what that. Oh, okay. Something about the order that they came out in, or I'm just gonna stick close to. Oh god. Oh god. Oh god. Oh, yeah. Oh, yep, that was a bad time. All right, Red Mage, can you salvage this? Red Mage. The, the, the Red Mage has definitely earned my commendation. Oh, God. All right. Oh, God. Ow, ow, ow. Oh my. Yeah, I definitely do not remember any of the mechanics to this, these bosses. There is a lot going on. There is a lot, there is a lot going on on the screen. I have to touch grass. Oh, never. <laughs> Oh God. Oh, okay. I touch I touch Marth, moss and bark. Thank you very much. Very discerning, tactile tastes. Oh God. Oh God. Ow, ow, that was me. Need to get the healer back up. The healer is me. Oh, oh God, oh God. Okay, uh, whoop. How's the chat doing? Okay, the chat is fine. You're good. <laughs> what, there? We're, we're all watching in trees. <laughs> <laughs> Decimation doesn't sound good. Oh god, oh god, come on. Oh, it's the rotation thing again. <laughs> oh, all right. Let's do this. Casters are slow to hit things when they're running. Oh, no. All right. 
right. I think, knock on wood, I th Oh, God, I didn't realize that was just going to hit every... Oh, my face. Yeah, the Red Mage has definitely, definitely earned a commentation. <laughs> Oh god, 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 oh okay. Phew. Nice. Oh. <laughs> Alrighty. Second boss of three down. It's a very dark quote that just showed up in the middle of the screen. Uh, oh my, there we go. Okay, the uh, Devil's Lettuce. Oh, I thought you were talking about grass when you mentioned Devil's Lettuce, not the name of a player. <laughs> oh no, I saw that on the screen. Global citizen. That's interesting. Character. No, yeah, that that that's not that's not a spell. <laughs> what would the what did it do? Would it, oh my! It really chills them out. The plenty kind of. Mm -hmm. We already have a spell called soothe. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, so okay, they're they're back again. This is a world that just kind of gave in to ennui. chill but i feel like that's a lie father still existed a star without strife when none remembered life's trials or its joys death by and we All right, you gonna keep on pulling, or are you gonna see that I'm struggling here? No, you're gonna keep on pulling. All right, wall to walls, all for the way, wall to wall pulls. Red mage needs some help. Poof! All right, chat's still good. Yeah, get you up. You need some essential dignity, friend. Phew. Oh, don't like the look of that. Alrighty. What its people had gained from ease, they lost to apathy. Alright. Tank's going f far. All right, that's as far as you go. Uh, you and your ambitious pulls. Oh, don't like that area of effect. All righty, let's try it. Oh. Oop, you need dignity, you need dignity, dignity. <laughs> I say lacking all dignity, just shortening it to dignity. And more, that's my last. I'm all out of dignity. <laughs> Xenoflora. Zeno just meaning kind of alien floor referring to plants. All right, this is it, the last boss of this dungeon. <laughs> oh. But this is our first, this is our tank's first time here too, so I'm so sorry to them that this is their first experience. It's so pretty though. But also, yeah. All righty. They'll make it out their first time. There we go. 
absolutely getting this kindest, most gentle of beast propaganda. Mm hmm. Ouch. Ooh, yeah, that was uh that was a spicy, spicy attack. Prance. Oh god. The steps were light and its gift was as painless as it was beautiful. Okay. Uh okay, don't like the look of this. Don't understand the look of this. Oh god. Oh god. Okay, yep, yep. It's gonna be one of those keeping you moving. Keeping you moving. Warm glow again is painful from a face. Oh wait, which way is the butterflies? Facing, don't want to be caught in those. Okay. Bubble. Oh, 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 yeah. Stay away from the left side. So deceiving because it's such like light-based magic. It looks like it would be healing or something. Yep, but no. It's only healing if you're bored with life. <laughs> Is that too grim for stream? I don't know. <laughs> you yeah, I didn't really don't want to be. Ouch. Well. <sighs> oh, wait, which way is the butterfly's faint? Point, 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 point. Oh, wait, there's a little thing on the ground. That helps. Okay. I don't have to try to see where the butterflies are facing. Huh. <laughs> oh, devil's lettuce is in trouble. There we go. You gotta be careful with the devil's lettuce. <laughs> Have you? Ouch. Yeah, that one is. That's the. Unescapable raid wide dam or group wide damage. Just have to be ready for. Oh my. Pity. I don't like the look of that. Alright, that wasn't too bad. The tank was good on their cooldowns. Pro oh, prancing. Fancy footwork of doom. There we go. Oh my, I stopped paying attention to the red mage. Red mage, you've been good to me. Let's try to bring you back to life. <laughs> Give you some dignity. Oh, get out of that. Hold <laughs> the punches in its last legs. Yeah. There we go. Oh, all right, red mage. So here, you get you get my commendation. <laughs> huh. Okay. <laughs> so that was see again very very pretty. Now, lights go out. And be in the stars again. Huh. All right. So we're close to time. But if folks mind, I'll just finish up my little some of my notes. That wasn't a natural 20. That, I don't think that was a natural 20. But I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, my. Oh. So, yeah. 
that was uh, that was one of the. I mean, it's not the hardest dungeons, but it's when I haven't played in a while, it challenges me. So, <laughs> one thing you'd think about the ties between astrology, astronomy, and medicine is that you know it stopped perhaps be being a thing after the Renaissance period, and that's kind of true. It certainly became less of a dramatic thing, um, but it still went on well into the nineteenth century. More specifically, actually, in relationship to doctors who were interested in trying to see... But like the 19th century actually was like when we see the rise of statistical thinking in the modern sense, right? They didn't have the same kind of forms of statistical analysis that we do now in, say, the Renaissance or the Middle Ages or whatnot, by and large. Um, but in the from like the 1700s to the 19th century, or so, so from the 18th century to the 19th century, um, there were a number of figures referencing like Robert Boyle, Richard Mead, uh, kind of British practitioners who started collecting statistical evidence that they argued proved that there was an influence on the moon upon fevers and the progression of fevers and other diseases that there were in fact like these critical days. And this notion of critical days in um, medicine again goes back to antiquity with both being connected to like the kind of like the outcome of the progression of a disease as well as kind of having astrological significance about the individual's relationship to the zodiac and uh, stellar forces. Um, and one of the reasons why this kind of attempt to combine an interest of understanding of like the moon and fever progression was in part because of the fact that so many more uh, colonial European doctors were being, uh, you know, practicing medicine in the like British colonies, right, where they were being introduced to a whole bunch of diseases that they hadn't seen before um, and were trying to make sense of their seasonal patterns. Now, this also goes back to antiquity, right? You think about something like malaria, which is an insect-borne disease, which certainly has patterns of getting better and worse, you know, like in terms of being more, more of an issue and less of an issue throughout the season because, well, it, mosquitoes are influenced by seasonal cycles. But if you don't know about the mosquito vector, you start just trying to tie it into what is it about these seasonal changes that actually make these diseases better or worse or, or more common or less common throughout the, uh, throughout the year. And I guess one final thing I want to kind of talk about is, oh, <laughs> from Idios, still, still impressed. Well, I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad you are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my. But the thing is, right, like, I mean, personally, I don't believe in astrology. Um, I think it has some very interesting historical kind of connections to medicine, but it's astrological thinking still influences people's medical decisions today. In fact, I was able to find one study from 2017 that actually uh, talks about how approximately 11% of the German population are convinced that certain moon phases and moon signs may impact their health and the onset and clinical course of diseases. Before elective surgery, a considerable number of patients look to optimize the timing of the procedure based on the lunar cycle. And apparently, especially patients awaiting liver donor uh, living, sorry, living donor kidney transplants. And so they actually conducted a study just trying to like prove or disprove spoiler alert, in this case, disprove an attempt to link lunar cycles to the prognosis of uh, living donor kidney transplants. So it's still part of our culture today, these ties. And uh, well, again, I don't personally believe in that in a contemporary sense. I think it's a really cool history to reference in relationship to fantasy and video game worlds, because it was part of the history of medicine for the vast majority of the history of medicine. And it's something I think that a lot of folks don't really, aren't really aware of nowadays. So yeah, the astrologian and medicine. A little bit of a disjointed talk, but that was, uh, that's some things. There's so many more things to explore on that topic too. Um, when I post the YouTube video, I'll, I'll share some uh, references and stuff, but there's so many different connections um, in terms of the history of medicine and science. So yeah, any other questions or anything? <laughs> I can get one more crit roll emote in here. Oh, what is that? Oh, that's a moon and a heart? Cool. It's two moons. Oh, it's two, oh, it's two moons. Oh, I see two moons. Cool. For Midios, it is interesting how certain practices still hold sway over people even when they're not really proven or anything. Like how someone who doesn't really believe in demons can still get nervous around Ouija boards. That's very true. I, I've seen people who are like, you know, about atheists, bordering on new atheists, who still get really freaked out about Ouija boards, whereas... I used to have one in my room as decoration. So again, different folks, um, different uh, beliefs. But yeah, no, it's true. I mean, we still, we st the thing is we still live in a world in which, you know, 
I mean, none of these beliefs have entirely gone away. People try to make sense of things that seem to be random. And, you know, even like you see like sports stars and stuff, right? They all have their different kind of like superstitions and little tricks and lucky socks and all these sorts of things. It's like, if, if it feels like the outcome of your actions are random, you do anything you can to try to get a quote unquote edge. And I think it then very much lends itself to that kind of thinking, which if it provides comfort, that's great. Um, you know, I, I have lots of things that I fiddle with and charms and stuff, but, uh, yeah. Anyone who's played D&D &D knows that <laughs> oh, yeah. no matter how balanced your dice are, if you roll bad twice in a row, it's gone forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That... People who are like, who would make fun of that, and then they start playing D&D, &D and they're like, I need a new dice, this one's broken. Yeah, this one's broken, or it's cursed, or like, oh, I'm going to yeah. punish this one by putting it in the <laughs> microwave for a little bit. Or like... Ooh, I should try that. <laughs> <laughs> Di dice shaming or special dice boxes. Like, yeah, that's definitely a thing I've seen in tabletop role-playing circles. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and again, I think that's another thing to think of, right? Like, we're very insecure about our health, and I think for a lot of particularly chronic conditions, honestly, modern Western medicine isn't always the best for dealing with chronic conditions. Um, you know, as, as someone with, a, with various disabilities that he didn't come to understand until later in life, I can understand, you know, if you don't have consistent access to medicine and healthcare, again, doing anything you can to try to, you know, be okay. Oh, yeah. Kind of like the gambler's fallacy. Yeah, that's true for Medeos. All right. But otherwise, that's all we really have time for tonight. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Um, again, if there's any particular game you'd like us to play, if there's any kind of topic you'd like us to talk about, if you have researcher reference questions, please feel free to ask us either um, during live stream sessions and chats, or you can email the librarians at uh, TRU. Thanks again for coming out. Hope the rest of the night is kind to you. Or dare I say, may the stars be auspicious and in your favor. <laughs> all right. Cheers, all. Okay.